Thanks for inviting me. I, this is my wife, Mirela. She's a genius, so that's why. For your wife. So I appreciate the opportunity, and I'm excited that I got people that are interested in what I did 40 years ago. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. And, you know, it's said in America that the Danish people are the happiest people in the world. And I can, I, I can understand why. I, we, we love being in Denmark, and it's a wonderful place. Um, so I'm Mike Drew. I was employee number 17 at Rational, and I was the director of hardware. And um, I'll be talking about something I designed 40 years ago. So forget, forgive my old memory. But here's evidence I'm not that old. Saturday, Mirella and I walked 20 kilometers around Copenhagen. 1,000 of those steps were, t and there's proof. I mean, I, I took that with my camera at the top this, of that tower. This is the most so interesting <laughs> place in all of Copenhagen. That's what I usually say. The top of that thing is the most interesting place in Copenhagen. It really, I mean, I, I have, uh, I can't say I didn't rest a few times on the way up, but. There are 400 steps. But here's, uh, I made it, right? You made it. Yeah, I swear. And so. you managed to photograph the, the ball on the top. That's a, that's you have must have held out your camera like this. I had to. I was worried about dropping my camera <laughs> because <laughs> when you go up that spiral, it ends. It just it, ends. It just I ends. know. It ends. I, I was it's expecting that. I thought there was a platform. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Not. <laughs> um, so yesterday we went to Hamlet's Castle, and I want to establish that I am a nerd. Not just that I have a nerd pack but that I'm always thinking nerdy things. So here's a quiz, a riddle. Who here knows what 0xd4 has to do with Hamlet? What's the connection between hexadecimal dog 4 and Hamlet? Anybody? Mirela? Not to be. Not to be. Oh. That's, that's, it takes a mechanical engineer, it takes a mechanical engineer to get that, right? <laughs> so I'm not going to waste a lot of time on who I am, but very briefly, I'm very proud that I'm a Vermonter. Vermont is the best state in the United States and the second smallest you know, it only has, how many people in Copenhagen? About 1.3 million. Oh, there's two people in Copenhagen for every person in Vermont, right? <laughs> so, but here's proof. I'm three years old and I'm picking potatoes with my, with my sisters. I was, and my dad, he just died last year at 98. And I would take him deer hunting every year. Here's it, 92. You know, he's got his gun and his cane. If he sees a deer, he drops a cane. But um, one of the things about Dad, and let me get this, um, is when, I, when they dropped me off at college, I was 16, and my mom cried all the way home. But my dad gave me this, and I've had this with me my entire career. And this says, the secret of success is in this box. You know, so dad gives me this and I go, ah, the secret of success is in this box. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, I mean, I had this on my desk every single job. And uh, my whole career, I've been working more than 50 years. And the rational years were some of the hardest working but most productive years. And we would work, and I'm not kidding, from 10 in the morning until 5 in the morning, and go, except for on Sundays. And then we'd go back, you know, get a little sleep, come back. We, you know, worked very, very hard uh, there. So I found my passion for hardware at MIT. This is a picture of me um, and the first computer I ever designed. This reminds me of that machine you have because these little boards here are exactly like that. Four transistors, eight resistors, a few capacitors, 
and it's maybe one flip-flop or three gates per board. And we just all push pin. Of course, we didn't have to worry about propagation delays. It was running out of megahertz. Well, twice as fast as that. <laughs> but, um, and I was lucky enough. Right after my parents dropped me off and my mom cried all the way back to Vermont, I immediately lucked out and met Dave Bernstein. For some reason, we both liked pool. We met at playing pool and we decided to be roommates. And Dave and I have been close. Our car right now is parked at his, in his yard. He lives in Boston, and we're flying back to Boston. Um, so Dave and I, um, Dave was the vice president of engineering at Rational. He and I got the passion for digital systems early. And, and when I look at that picture, and I think about what I'm doing now, or just you showing me that stuff you showed me with that thousand CPS printer. I mean, I'm as happy doing this stuff now. So it's very important to find your passion in life. When I try to mentor young kids, I try, you got to find out what you're good about and, and what's not work, which just you're good at and you're happy doing and designing that. No, Dave and I, so our junior year, our professor that was here got us a job at Data General. So I had a choice to go back to Vermont, live with my mother, and work in the toilet paper factory, or stay in Cambridge, live with my girlfriend, and design computers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, so Dave and I, that, we were, I was 19, and we designed the Nova 2. And I see you have a Nova 2 here. That was designed by a couple kids. That's why when you ask, if I ever work for a big company, tell me a big company that would let two 19-year-olds design a computer, right? Data General had that environment, though. You know, it's whatever, whatever you can do, or whoever can do it best, do it, you know? And so I joined Rational as employee 17. Dave was 16. He got there a month before me. And he was the VP of engineering, so he's my, he was actually my, so what happened is we graduated from MIT, he went immediately to Data General and designed the Nova 3, where I stayed at MIT and worked with Marvin Minsky on AI, and ever since he's been my boss, now that doesn't mean don't go to graduate school, <laughs> but, but it means, but that's what's happened. He stayed there, he was my boss at, at Data General, I mean, at, well, he was my boss at Data General and my boss at, at Rational. So enough of the personal stuff. So now about Rational. So we were formed in, 90, in 80, 1981 by three Air Force Academy grads. These, were, these guys were, um, they saw the potential for ADA. They saw the horrible type of software architecture and just spaghetti code that existed out there. And especially Grady Booch. If any of you know software, you know who Grady Booch is. And Mike Devlin was the was the software guy, and Paul Levy was a business guy. So the Air Force Academy sent them both to Stanford, and that's how they came out there. Grady stayed in Colorado Springs at the and worked at the at the Air Force Academy. They had to do their time in the Air Force, but they were lucky. But they worked at the Blue Cube, Mike and Paul, which was this top secret Air Force base in Sunnyvale, had to do with satellite tracking. And they would often come to work in their captain's uniforms and, you know, it was good that they could coexist. The first financing was Arthur Rock, and he was the chairman of the board, but he was the, the guy that financed Apple and Intel. So we felt very special that we had that type of, because he really was convinced that we were on to something, to revolutionize, revolutionize software. And he backed us with, with money. So we never really had money problems in the first few years at all. And one time he came when we got the first prototype, and he, he, I'm showing him the machine. He goes, well, where's the compiler? <laughs> I'm a hardware guy. I mean, what do you mean, where's the compiler? So I pointed to the disk, right? I mean, here's, the, I mean, it's just bits, Arthur. Um, at, 
but one of the good things, we had a rule, nobody left on Thursday. So every Thursday we would have a barbecue for the whole company and then we would stay and we would have a seminar. So somebody would present what they're working on. And that was great for the culture because, I mean, everybody knew what everybody else was working on. And you can't believe how many hardware problems were solved by some software guy that I was explaining what I was doing. Or even once in a while I would solve a software problem that a software guy would, you know, that type of collaborative environment was, I mean, Rational was a special company, in, especially in those days. And th these things usually lasted past midnight. That's why this nobody leaves on Thursday rule. <laughs> and um, then on Fridays, most of us would go to Grand China and have Chinese food and eat, and that would kind of end. But we usually work Saturdays as well. And we used to have company picnics. And the first one I remember well because William Perry, who he's still alive, he's about 95. He's the former DOD secretary, um, Department of Defense. So he was a, and he's, he's considered the father of the cruise missile. Now, I'm a pacifist. I'm not so much into military and everything, but, and there was a lot of connection, though, with ADA and military in those days, and I tolerated it. And this guy was a reasonable, I mean, his philosophy is the cruise missile was going to save lives and, and support peace. So he was, so we had very, very influential people. And I'm talking about a company with like 25 nerds, right? And that's, that's what we were in can the early days. Can I ask a question before you? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, this question here, where is the compiler? What kind of answer did he expect to get? Well, see, he, all he knew is that one of our biggest milestones was we were going to sell an ADA compiler to Rome. Yes, okay. And, um, that was going to bring money. That's the first time we brought, see, he's money, right? Yeah, right. So he's, he's saying, you know, yeah, we've got we to gotta develop this ADA compiler for Rome. And so when I'm showing him all my hardware and where's the compiler? Okay, so he wasn't he to say he's not technical at all. All right, all right. No, Arthur Rock is just a money man. Yeah, all right. Okay. Okay. And, you know, so he, he wanted to yeah, see there is some. <laughs> So, um, when we started out, we made a few very, very important design decisions early. And the first one was that we would use CAD. Now, I'm talking 1982, early 1982. There was no CAD. Luckily, when I flew out in late 81 to interview there, the, on the airplane from Boston to San Francisco was a guy I worked with at Data General that had just started, he was the CEO of Daisy. And so Daisy was a company that was a startup and we were their first customer. I, I, I arranged for Mike Devlin, one of the founders and I, that was part of my interview. <laughs> Here Mike, let's go buy some Daisies. Because if you want me to design all this hardware with like five different, five guys, that's all I had, or four hardware guys and a software guy, I, I need CAD, and CAD's the way to go. So that was a very important one. And we spent $150,000 to buy, there were 75,000 each, which was a lot. That impressed me, and I, I was sold anyways, but I tried to play a little hard to get, you know. <laughs> but, but anyways, the fact that they were willing to invest because that's been the key to my career too, is a small group of smart people with the right tools can do with a hundred other ones. Our, our CFO was at a party, uh, you know, in the old days and rubbing shoulders with, you know, chief financial officers and, and how we built these, this big 128-bit machine and everything. And they ask him, how many hardware guys do you have? He goes, four, <coughs> and they couldn't believe him. But then he said, well, Mike's the director of hardware, and he designed some too. So we really had five, right? <laughs> so, but, but anyways, the next big decision we made was to go right to PCB. I saw one of your wire wrap. I don't know how many of you guys have ever struggled with wire wrap, right? 
You have, yeah. You know how it always breaks out right at the, and you can, some you can't even see. It's just, you know, it looks perfect, yet it's discontinuous. It was horrible. I had already put in my dues with YRAP. I said, if we write a simulator, we can go right to printed circuit board, and it'll be quicker, we'll get a product earlier. People, oh, we're gonna waste all this money. We have five boards, all five of them work first time. Mostly based on the simulator, but also just good solid layout. And the fact that, you know, in the old days you used to have the red line, one guy was with the, the, the net list with layout, and the other guy is at the schematic and red line this. You know, I mean, none of that. And so we were able to go right, right to PCB, and that was important. And, you know, we had a simulator, but we were rational, right? We always said, software are us. I don't know, if there's a thing in America, toys are us, or whatever, you know, right? And it was, of course, written in ADA. And that was one of the great things about rational, was that we were our own best customer, right? I mean, a lot of companies, they have a test group that tests the product and tries to figure out different user scenarios. No, I'm rational. <laughs> we had a tool to write ADA, and what did we do? Write a lot of ADA, you know? So we were our own best test. So the next thing was that we would upfront build in powerful, powerful diagnostics. We wouldn't treat test as an afterthought. Test was the first thought. And what we did is we found the Intel 8051, which is a very primitive little microcontroller. It had 128 bytes of RAM. But it was very, had a lot of ROM. So you could build descriptors of, data, of, of registers and things like that in ROM. And so we had what we call a diagnostic archipelago. You know the word archipelago is just, you know, many islands. You're like Indonesia. Indonesia is an archipelago. So we called it a, because every board had the diagnostic island, had an 8052. And we also decided when we looked at layout and how to do things, that we would have a back plane and a four plane. And what that meant, if you, we don't have one of the boards, but it was, you know, a big board and if you think about layout, if everything goes to the back plane, you'd have signals that would have to come up and around again. But the way the flow of the signals worked, it would go between the back plane and the four plane. So if you, you know, you look at these boards, I mean, we, we laid out these pretty complicated boards with four layer boards. And remember, two of the layers power and ground, you know, so it's just one signal pair. And, um, so that's, um, that was very important. And it, it turned out it was useful for hardware debugging, and then useful for manufacturing, and then useful for, for service. And um, I'd skip back to that. But yeah, anyways, yeah. the layout was a lot easier, and we did it with four layer birds because we put the back. Now, the four planes proved to be a little bit of a problem Somehow they were, because they had to be zero insertion force. So there was those little levers. But the field guys learned that you just twist the lever a couple of times and then it would make contact. But there was also a good diagnostic. If there was any discontinuity in the four plane, we'd find it out like that. And the final thing was, you know, we would go with our strengths. Our strengths was designing an ADA machine. It wasn't I.O. And that's why I don't know so much about the I.O. I, I stay away from I.O. Anyways, so what we ended up with, we used to call it the world's most expensive unibus peripheral. Because there was actually four, the first machine, the Series 100, was a um, quad processor. It was a huge monster. And it had four PDP-11s built in to control all the I.O. I mean, it was amazing, and um, so that's th that was part of it. Is let DEC worry about I/O, and we could buy off-the-shelf DEC tape controllers, COM controllers, 
disc controllers, things like that. So, so well, why why digital? Why not data general? What? Why digital? Why not data general? Digital had been a while. Okay. Well, you know, you saw the Nova two. Yeah. And I mean that I/O was was you, you, ugly. You, you knew but, that one. <laughs> but also off the shelf I/O controllers. So in those days, you couldn't go off and buy a comm controller. You had to buy it from Data General. Oh, okay. Whereas you could buy an off-the-shelf um, tape controller, disc controller, comm controller. Those were the three main ones. Ethernet was like a dream in those. I mean, we didn't even have that. Who, um, who, who made your ADA compiler? Who made the ADA compiler? Yeah, yeah. Harold. Harold. <laughs> We had a one-man compiler one guy. Compiler. Okay. You know, we that was the first job, was actually to make an ADA compiler okay. and sell it to Rome. Yeah. So we sold it to Rome. Who then they were they made a military version of the Data General machine. Okay. So R O H M is the name of it, or R O L M, I think. Yeah. And so <clears throat> Harold, <laughs> he was just an amazing guy. He was one of these kind of, you know, out there software guys. I mean, like, wasn't really part of the universe, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Harold was an interesting guy. I like him. Harold Larson was his name. He was a smart guy. Well, obviously. But he, a one-man compiler guy, and he did what 30 people at DEC were trying to do. Exactly. And Harold did it in half the time that they didn't do it, right? <laughs> they never... <laughs> so... Now, diagnostic was the important you know, one of the things I taught. And so, one of the, the specs I made, requirements for the boards, is every board would drive and receive its external pins. So even if I was driving a, a pin to Paul Henning's board, not only would he have to also drive it himself and receive it, but I would have to receive it. That way, if the board was standalone and there was a problem with connectivity to the backplane, we could detect it. So we wanted to be able to detect 100% coverage of every board standalone. So also that all registers were either scannable or you could do an operation to make it load into a scannable register. This was before what the, they call boundary scan and things like that nowadays. We came up with it back then. and. So we also, then we made a test board with a zero insertion force. That's what I mean by ZEF. Zero insertion force connector. You, I see you have one there. It's, you know, you can plug the board in and it is powered. You have a com, you have a UART line to the 8051 and you could run 100% coverage diagnostics. And so that turned out to be um, absolutely useful and bringing up the hardware, it turned out to be very useful. I mean, that's how manufacturing tested the boards. And these are the days when people were spending $50,000 for a bed and nails tester, you know, to test boards. And they would spend not only, I mean, that was just for the jig. And then they would have the people program it. Cost you another 50000 I mean, test... Test fixtures were costing hundred thousand dollars to manufacture in those days. Ours cost, I think, fifteen hundred dollars, <laughs> right, just to make these jigs because it was built in. And Chris Jakes is a genius. I mean, if Chris Jakes were alive today, all your problems would be over because <laughs> his memory was. Uh, it's very. I mean, I'm sure he would know the answer to a lot of things. And he was a software genius. So, one of the things I've always done, I've been a, people say, why are you still a director, right? Because I was a director of hardware at Rational in 81. And then I was director at Intuitive Surgical in 91. And then, you know, I was director, and I say, I want on my tombstone, he never was a VP. Because I want to do real work, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, but anyways, um, every group I've had, I said, I, I want a good software person in the hardware group, you know, because tools are important. And it's not just tools you can buy. 90% of the useful tools are the ones you, you build yourself. So, um, 
and also diagnostics. We didn't have a diagnostic group. I just said to each hardware guy, and I did it too, you're going to write your own diagnostics. Now, how better can the hardware guy communicate with the diagnostic guy? Excuse me, well, I'm not being sexist. There were no, I'll say guy, okay? If the hardware guy was the diagnostic guy, the communication was quite good, you know. So, and we all, in, and in those days there were these like graphs that show how many thousand lines of code the average software guy writes. And 50,000 was like a really super good guy. But one of the things that's very interesting is you, you see that graph and then it goes down. And why does it go down? Because the best software people write less code. It's just more elegant, right? <laughs> you know. But we all wrote, and you asked why it was Pascal. It was like, it was, at first, it was for the, you know, 80, 6800, or for the PDP 11. And the first diagnostics ran on the PDP 11. You couldn't, there were no ADA compiler. DEC had 30 guys trying to do what Harold did in one or Howard did in one and never had it. There wasn't an ADA compiler for a DEC machine. And I'm glad there wasn't because then we would have, when we switched to the 68,000, we would have had to have a problem. So one of the things about it is there was a signal and it was called diag freeze and any board could pull it down and that would stop the clock. I mean, I designed the whole clock system to be like stop on a dime. You can stop in the same cycle that the error was detected. And that means the data is preserved. And then you could scan it out. So we would create what we called a tombstone file. And then we wrote what we call post-mortem diagnostics. And it would isolate to the frill. And it turns out the first machine that failed was in Sunnyvale at Moffett Air Force Base. And they were testing it so it wasn't in a secure area so that we had remote diagnostics. And our guy showed up with a board in hand just as they were figuring out that the machine crashed and he replaced it. So it was good feedback of this, this remote diagnostics. And, and uh, Now, in terms of the board petitioning and the hardware team, again, I was the hardware director. I'm just, you know, we'll get Grady Booch here sometime or somebody to talk about software. but. Um, and I designed the memory board. I wanted to blaze the trail for Daisy to show the standards of how we design, how we name signals, and how we draw schematics, but also how we lay them out. So the first design was eight megabytes because it was, you know, huge amount of RAM in those days, 256K bits per chip. Um, but the first thing I decided was that I didn't want to build in another whole section that most computers did. If you look at any computers, the VAX, the MV6000, which are like coincident with this machine, they all, and all the IBM machines, they would have what they called an address translation unit. And it would take the logical address in and go up in the table, page table lookup, and then create the physical address, and then you would address the memory. No. You know, generally at, at Rational, w one of our first questions when we had to design something was, how does everybody else do it? And you'd get the answer, you say, okay, that's not how we're going to do it. <laughs> right? So, you know, that. So what I, I was enamored with, I, I was designing caches at Data General and was designing four set associative in those days. And what I came up with is a design where, in, so when you have dynamic RAMs, you have what's called row address strobe, column address strobe. Because 256K bits needed 18 bits. They didn't want to have 18 pins. So they time multiplex the address pins. And also the way they, the internals work, they had rows and columns. So the row address was given first and then the column address. So we would give the row address from just a hash function. It was five nanoseconds 
delay through an exclusive OR gate. So we would take the logical address, hash it down to a page, and then that would be the row address. Now, in parallel with the row address axis, and in time for the column address stub, I would quadruple pump four duplicated tag stores to get 16 set associative. And if you look at graphs of set associativity numbers, it gets asymptotic with infinite, or fully associative at around eight. In fact, nowadays, you don't see even in Today's, they have level one caches, level two caches, level three caches. You don't see something that's even eight set associative. Sometimes you might, but I haven't studied that in a while. I've been out of computer design for quite a while. But anyways, this was 16 set associative. So it was nearly, it, it was just, you just give it the logical address and it'll go, oh, here's your 128 bits. It was 128 bits wide. And so there was no notion of a physical address. It kind of was deep down in the diagnostics. You say, I want to get at this RAM. You know, you could do it. But. And so it was 128 bits. And it was just recently, you know, that there were 128 ma machines out, right? I mean, this machine, the rational machine, was a 128-bit machine in the 80s. Um, by the way, the PC board fab house took my Gerber to, after laying it out, and they go, Barr! no, you've got 0.2 vias for every component pad. Our software says you have to have at least one via for every component pad. And I said, why? I mean, you know, <laughs> you can lay the board out where if you do and you scramble your data, and we did it right. And that's where Chris came in. Chris could take the schematics in the database of DAISY and then just figure out how to lay it out and redo the schematics, and it would just lay out as straight shots, as we call it. And there literally was five component pads for every via on that board. So they finally, I convinced them, build it. I'll sign a disclosure. <laughs> you know, it's fine. There's not that many vias. Um, and that's an example of what we eventually call the gestalt design methodology. Gestalt meaning the psychiatry of the whole, where, you know, Herr Gestalt came up with a thing that the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So, but a design, you have to think about the physical design, the logical design, the manufacturability, the testability, the um, supportability, maintainability, if you think about it all at once, you know, you come up with a better design. And that was an example of the Gestalt design. The Val type and FIU. So Steve Schroeder did, I, I put the initials down because later we'll get into the, we, one of the things I did on every backplane is put the initials of everybody in the company on the backplane to really show that was, everybody had a part of it. And so Steve Schroeder, he lives in Portland now. He came to our house with Mary a few, you know, he, you know, he, I'm gonna contact him, he might remember. But I think he left before the 400. I'm a little unclear exactly when people left. He did both the vowel and the type. And the reason for that is they're pretty identical in the sense that it's one big 64-bit ALU. The, the type board has extra stuff. So for instance, in the rational machine, you can say, I declare a, an integer that's between minus seven and plus 66. And it would, the compiler would immediately say, ah, that can fit in seven bits. And here's the lower bound, here's the upper bound. And the type board would check that in, in on the fly, whereas on a traditional machine, your compiler would have to generate extra code. Okay, this is this type, and you know, is it greater than the lower bound, less than the upper bound, all that in series, whereas the type board would do it all in parallel, which is good. Now, Steve, we, this board became known as a monument to MSI, which is basically, 
MSI means medium scale integration. So that means, you know, you look, you got the list of parts, right? They're all like quad this, octal this, right? I mean, it's just, and they're all mostly 20 pin dual inline, you know, 10th inch space, easy to solder parts. And that's really what the rational machine was. And, you know, but that's all you really had in those days. Steve was actually a high school friend of Mike Devlin, and he was the first hire. At, you know, Grady, Mike, and Paul said, okay, we're going to need a hardware guy because they decided really up front we're going to need to build our own hardware. And they did. Um, next was Mark Frappier that did the FIU. So I would give him 128 bits wide from the memory board, and he had these, I mean, you s how many multiplexers were on that board, but, because in the olden days, you didn't have these chips that did, you know, what they call barrel shifters. You know, it was all done with multiplexers. And we should probably say at this point that the rational computer doesn't work on bytes. It works on bits. Right. So your integer might be seven bits or 13 bits. Yeah. And it can be anywhere in the board. Right, yeah. The, it, we had a bit addressable logical you had a logical address which was addressing the bit. And then part of the type declaration was how many bits. If it was more than 64 wide, I forgot what we did. The, then the compiler had to chop it up. But, but also the FIU, though, would deal with fields. So you could say, I want a two-bit field. And if you're really unlucky, it's the last bit in this 128 and the first bit in the next 128. It would handle that automatically. And, Go ask me, and and I was my board was smart enough to say it's the next column. Now, it's possible that you're really unlucky and you're crossing a page boundary, and then you have to re you know a two bit entity could cross a page boundary. I mean theoretically, and when that happened, it still didn't involve any type of interrupt. It just meant that I had to go rehash and do a another RAS, row address scope. And Mark worked with me at Data General. And so he was the first occupant of the Massachusetts halfway house. Now what was the Massachusetts halfway house? One of the things they did to get me to come out was they said, okay, we'll buy you a house with a pool in Sunnyvale. I said, okay. Now I was already sold on rational, but <laughs> it pays to play hard to get, right? But anyways, but one of the things was we're going to hire a lot of people from outside of California. So one of the things about you, this rational home that you now have is you've got to put people up to transition. So most of them were data general people that I hired or Dave hired that we have what we call the rational mafia or, or the data general mafia. And Mark, Mark and Nina, his wife, were the first occupants of the Massachusetts halfway house. The other thing was Grady Booch um, stayed off and worked at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. So anytime Grady Booch came to Rational, to San Francisco, to Silicon Valley, you know, he, I was supposed to let him stay at my house, which wasn't like, it wasn't a burden. I love to have Grady's, I mean, I learned so much from Grady, it's unbelievable. I mean, he's a, he's a sharp guy. So that's what I mean by the Massachusetts halfway house. 1509, you know, Bellardo, Sunnyvale. Then we have the sequencer sys and IOA. So Ed Pollack did the sequencer. And again, we're getting into areas that, like, it's not quite IO, but I just let Ed handle that. And it had a writable control store. And it was Basically, it just, con you know, sent fields out to everybody else to control all the ALUs and bus transfers and all that. It was somewhat uninteresting. Don't tell Ed that. Ed, a lot of people actually that worked for me in the early days are VPs, right? <laughs> he turned out to be a VP at Sony, and he's, he was very successful after Rational. And um, so he did that. Jim Wilson did the sys board. Now the sys doesn't exist on your machine because that was the board that handled the multiprocessing because the first R1000 was a multiprocessor and 
um, it had an arbiter. So the address space, the logical address space was common among all four and it would arbitrate and you know, do what's called cache coherence. You know, the concept of cache coherence says that if I've got a cache over here and a cache over here, if I write, it better be reflected over in this other cache, you know, because you're all reflecting the same universal memory. And Jim is a pretty bright guy. He lives in, um, he's retired, he lives in Arizona now, and I have contact with him. I'm going to ask him, but I think he left early because we punted the sys. So we'll find that out. Now, Dave Bernstein did the IO adapter. So that only existed in the R1000 Series 100 because that was the board that interfaced to the PDP-11. Um, but Dave did an amazing job because he was the vice president of engineering. So he, ha he had other unreal work. Now, all managers at Rational did real work, meaning we managed by examples and we did design. We considered like sales and marketing, stuff like that is like a necessary evil, but they didn't do real work. I mean, we did the real work. We were the engineers. We were the nerds, right? So anyways, um, so Dave not only was hiring up a team and, you know, he was VP of engineering, so he was more important than hardware. And I used to admit it, we five hardware guys were, the software guys thought of us like we thought of the marketing guys as a <laughs> necessary evil, right? Necessary. But, but, you know, he, he managed all the software, which is really what data general, I mean, that those, I mean, what rational was about. You know, he, um, if you look at the different things like, you know, source control and, you know, um, just semantic driven editors and, you know, at, at, you know, the old days, you know, the things you get now in the Eclipse environment or other programming environment where you say, show me where this variable is declared and you just press a button and now you're over at the source where this variable was declared. So um, that was Dave. Now the sixth person in the group was Chris Jakes who he worked for me at Data General on the micro eclipse. So I mean the first thing I did as I jumped to be a director of the, the next company was hire Chris, right? So the first thing I did at Rational was hire Chris. The first thing I did at Intuitive Surgical, hire Chris, right? <laughs> I mean, he was one of the smartest guys I've ever worked with. And that's saying a lot because of these, you know, we're talking about Grady Booch and Dave Bernstein and people like that. Um, so he did Xmon and the 8051 interpreter plus the DAISY tools. And like I say, every hardware group needs a software person. I mean, you really want to have tools to make your job easier. You know, in general, we're lazy. I mean, I don't like doing, and in fact, I'm very bad at tedious tasks. You know, I don't do tedious tasks well. Computers do tedious tasks well, but you need a really good software guy to understand your requirements and then, and then make a tool that does it. So that, that was Chris. So then we get into, okay, the, more of the history of the machines, you know. So the Series 100 was, we did in 1983. We shipped the first one to Lockheed Martin, although Dave Bernstein told me the other day that was to Rome. I don't know. We'll have to get our memories lined up. We still know how to get a hold of Paul and Mike. Paul lives in, in Hawaii on Oahu, and Mike, I don't know where he is, but people know how to talk to him. But... It was a massive machine. I mean, I mean, I still got just the I/O cabinet in my garage. I use as a tool chest, and of course, it's got it's got disk slides, so I can pull out a drawer the whole way and look down into it because it's it's really a disk. But um, it was huge, and Mike was a big guy. He's bigger than me, and part of our UL safety testing was you have to be able to tip it. 20 degrees and it should write itself. And it took everything 
that Mike and I could do to tip it. And I remember Bob Walton, the software or the manufacturing guy with a protractor going, okay, you're at 18 degrees, 18, you have to go to 20, oh, okay, we're at 20, no, jump. <laughs> and sure enough, the thing came back and it didn't, it would have killed us if it would have tipped over. It was a huge machine. It's amazing we, we built that. And it cost a million dollars, I mean, but Lockheed paid for it, you know, government money. But anyways, so we got a lot of feedback that we don't want to do multiprocessing. So we punted the multiprocessing and the PV-11s. And this was a critical thing. And I didn't even appreciate until I, I, I parked, we parked our car at Dave's house in Massachusetts because we came from our home in Vermont to, to fly out here. And so I s talked a little about it here. And he told me about the amount of effort he had to do to convince DEC to license the Unibus to us, okay? Because we weren't about to design our own tape controller, our own disc controller, or a comm controller. Why do that? That's I.O., you know? I mean, somebody else does that better than us. And we already had drivers for those Unibus peripherals. So Dave managed to, I forgot who it was, somebody who was a past DG person was at, actually at DEC at the time that Jeff Kalb was the guy's name. Jeff Kalb was the guy that, that headed Data General Semiconductors. And he ended up switching over to DEC after Data General kind of went down. And he convinced Jeff Kalb to sign off on us having a Unibus patent, which was, which was very good. And we, I don't know how we, Dave sold it, but Dave's a good salesman. And so we could keep the Unibus, but design a six, Motorola 68000. Did I say 6800? That's either a typo or, it used to be a 6800, right? Um, and we hired Wayne. Wayne was another resident of the Massachusetts halfway house because we knew him from Data General. And we hired a guy, Ken Barton, from Tandem, who is a really good mechanical engineer who did, you know, the redesign of it, which was much more respectable. But it was still big because it had a big old hunk in tape drives and those washing machine discs almost, you know, in those days those discs were pretty big. But again, that's I.O. I don't do I.O. I do hardware. <laughs> but um, so the next we got into you know, again, this is I.O., which is, um, it just kept getting better and smaller. So this, we called it a skin job, but if you see a 300, it's a lot smaller, but not as small as a 400, but it didn't have a real tall cabinet with disc, with tape drives and things like that. It had, you know, modern, and I think the, di the disc, whoops, the disc drives were, um, they just kept getting smaller. I forget exactly what the form. Not only, of course, you know, everybody knows Moore's Law, right? I mean, not only got smaller, got higher capacity at the same time, a win-win. And the 400 is the one that you have here. And that was the ultimate one. There we finally said, okay, memory chips are now, you know, four times bigger. Um, design a 32 meg. So I designed that. Now, it wasn't a huge hit for some of the software guys because it then only had eight set associative. Oh, that's how it was. I was trying to think how I did 16 set associative, but it was four sets per board, and each board there was four boards. So um, here it was only eight set associative, which luckily by then the kernel guys had figured out how the, the code got allocated and could flatten it out so that, you know, the, the kernel would not take any more than two sets, you know. So, so why does the 400 only have two memory boards? We it's just, just wanted to make it smaller. Well, I mean, who ever needed more than <laughs> 64 megabytes? <laughs> I mean, come on. I think there was a guy called Bill who said he wanted 640. 
<laughs> it was like I remember in the early days of Data General when, you know, we were talking about the MV6000, or, you know, the, I worked on the Solar Machine predecessors, right? We wanted not 16. Now, the one that they first did was just way out there. You know, and it, you know, it was almost as complicated as rational. Then the next one was Ego, which was a really re reasonable 32-bit architecture. But it wasn't compatible with, with, it was compiler compatible, but not assembler compatible with existing code. And so the powers that be at Data General canceled Ego and did that MV8000. That's when most of us quit. They said, don't quit form a microprocessor group, and that's when I did the micro eclipse. But um, I remember back then, we were a 32-bit machine. Wow, 32 bits of address space. I mean, we're talking about 16 bits of address space in the old mini computer. Wow, and Data General was smart, and it was 16 bits. So that gives you 128 kilobytes. Who, you know, and that was more than enough. But then, wow, 32-bit address space. Four gigabytes of memory. That's just like, ah, more than anybody needed. So, I mean, here, we we're still in that kind of mindset back in 1990. I mean, 64 megabytes, that's more memory than you're ever going to need, right? So, it was more the issue of only eight sets associative that was the problem. Plus, you saw that little exabyte tape. Those little exabytes would... Um, that's the first time I learned the term exa, you know, the, you know, peta, exa. And then, you know, 2 to the 24th wasn't named. Do you know what they named it? Hella. <laughs> really, so helibyte, true, look it up. A helibyte <laughs> is beyond yada. There's yadabyte, and now there's helibyte, because they just keep having, I don't know, I mean, I think that's 2 to the 27th, right, or something. Yeah. You know. How, I got to go through it. Exa is, well, peta is 2 to the 12. 2 to the 15th is exa. And then 2 to the 18th, yeah. Take that offline. Um, anyhow, that's, that's the series, okay. And so, so at no point in this do you actually make the, computer, the CPU run faster. What's that? You didn't make, try to make the CPU run faster? No, because the... That would be redesigning the whole thing. Plus, it was running at five megahertz. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> gosh. No, but I mean, I mean, how much faster can you go? No, but I mean, by, by, by uh, 1990, you would have access to ALS technology chips and stuff like that. Yeah, we actually did bring some ALS in, but you saw how many chips are there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So think how many independent paths had to work in 200 nanoseconds, you know? Uh, to, you know, and, you know, I thought about it. I'd like it. Well, we tried a design with 2901s. Yeah. So you could get a 2901, you could theoretically run at, you know, 10 megabits, megahertz, and, and read it. But it was just too much design. There's already a lot of investment in um, manufacturing and everything. And, yeah, it, that machine runs as same speed as... The series 100 back in 83. It, now, you've got to forgive me. Y you let me take that picture without cleaning it. Yeah. Usually I take <laughs> I dug this out of our basement. And I actually do have an R1000 backplane just to show. And you know these, these are arc welder. You know, these independently were powered. Right, 200 amp power supplies each. You've seen those cables coming, they're arc welder. Once I was debugging and I shorted out power and ground, and immediately my brass rat, this is an MIT school ring, my brass rat was red hot and I'm going, crap. Luckily Chris Jakes was there and he slaps my hand and two red hot pins, <laughs> not this one, because the one that is missing two pins were welded to my rat. You know, we learn real quick to not wear rings when we're poking around, you know, the back plane when that's powered. Because 
200 amps. I mean, the whole sum of everything was 400 amps per processor. But, you know, if you shorted two pins, it would give you the four. It would melt things because it was distributed. I mean, if you look real careful, you can see G, 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 G. Those are where there's grounds. We use that because we would put logic analyzers on there. This dust is courtesy of Half Moon Bay. That was added after the design. <laughs> but, um, and then there's six here. That's because there were four I.O. controllers. See, so this is Dave's I.O. controller board. So each of those goes to a PDP-11? Each one of these had a back, a, 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 a unibus connector in the back. Right. It did not have a four plane. See, right. so there was a four plane here yeah. on these boards and on each one of these. But these four just had, it, just, it was like we said, this was the world's most expensive Unibus peripheral, <laughs> right? Because it just plugged into Unibus. And it's hard to see on that one, but one of the things I did was, I was, we were always very proud of it. We were proud of everybody, even the marketing and the, and the sales and the necessary evil people. So we would put everybody's um, name on the back plane, including Ada. So I, I would always put Ada first because she, she was the first. But this is everybody, um, I don't even know where, MBD. I, I must have put myself there. It, it, it looks like you sorted them by last name. It's sorted by last name, so I think I, I, I might, might have chopped that off. I'd probably be down here then. Um, anyways, um, we have everybody's, it's amazing. I chopped that off, that's too bad. <laughs> Remind me to take another picture of that when we're back. Um, but this shows that we replaced the SysBus with the IOC. Even at the- So this is a 200? This is the Series 300, okay. so it's 1986, that's how we could tell. And so this tells us how many people were in the company, so it's four, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I think there's some list, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's about a hundred people. And, but some of them, somewhere here, at some point somebody made me put rock in there for Arthur Rock. I don't think I did it this time. That's a um, all the way to did the anybody see? Yeah, there's rock. So he's not an employee, he's the chairman of the board, the money guy that asks where's the compiler. And, but you also have Diane. What's and that? We also have Diane. And That's not, th that, that was, we didn't have a lot of women, oh, okay. but there was this hot software woman, <laughs> oh, Diana. That was, that was her. The, uh, the Ada semantic folder. Not Diana. Oh, no, okay. Diana was the intermediate. Ah, okay, but okay. see, GGD, that's, that's, um, Gary Davidian. Yeah. We need to find him. Yeah. MTBD is Mike Devlin. And then we did the 400, or the 300. So that was the 200. Yeah, it must be the 200. Yeah. Right. This is the 300. Now, let's see here. So I still put Arthur Rock in there. Now, here's how I dated that. Because I, Dave and I couldn't remember the 400. And I know that my daughter Laurel was born in 1989, and there's no Laurel there. So the first machine I put Laurel on was was the 400. But I got to be on this back plane. What the hell is going on <laughs> there? I I know I was there the whole time. That's me. Dave Bernstein is DHB. Whatever. I, I don't know if we put rock we put rock on that one. And Barbie was these are real people, Diane Barbie that. Um Wendy was another woman programmer, but um so I, I had room there on that to put them all. Then we got into the four hundred, which you have, and then we have like two hundred people, and you can't even see that totally here, but um, that doesn't make it bigger, that scrolls. <laughs> I don't know how to make it bigger. But Tom Knight, the layout guy, 
what we did is we found a bunch of instances w where there were two letter initials so we could fit three ah. you see there we could fit three so we fit but and they were upset because we couldn't fit it but you see there's Laurel that's my firstborn so she <laughs> shouldn't really be on there but this helps date it so I know that this is post 1989 because Laurel was born in 1989 and of course Ada always was on top I think I might have lost rock in order to fit rock was more important to me less important to me than than Laurel so yeah I don't see rock there anymore he got and I think he kind of drifted away from us after you know this is 89 um, and you guys know what those look like so that's basically it um, that I could prepare and thanks for the opportunity do you guys have any questions could you, could you talk a little bit about the Nova 2 what's that could you talk a little bit about the Nova 2 sure so I already told you the story about my horrible choice and dilemma and I decided to stay in Cambridge and live with my girlfriend and <laughs> decide. So we get there and we, we met Larry Seligman who designed the Nova 1200 and he saw that Dave and I really were enthusiastic, really were sharp, knew what we were doing and he said look I bet using this 74172 which was a new chip out of TI which was a quadruport RAM so because that was a big thing I mean you have four accumulators you got all the data paths to multiplex them into an ALU here it was all your accumulators on one chip you know and it was quadruport which you needed because you want you only needed three ports really you needed two right read ports and one right port but actually the second right port turned out to be a nice thing to have too because what Data General had was this notion of in the instruction set that you could shift the output you couldn't it wasn't a barrel shifter but it was either it was actually left right or swap so you could also swap the bytes so I think we did a swap the bytes with the other port and so you saved the multiplexer but um, so Larry said you know based on this you know he had said look I did the 1200 it took a you know 1.2 microsecond so it was like what 800 and something kilohertz yeah. machine but I think you guys can design a machine the other the earlier machine was an 800 which actually was a 1.25 megahertz machine that was on two boards but both the 1200 and 800 were core memory based so they were really the architecture was ugly and the control structure of the processors was you know intertwined with inhibit wires and sense wires on the core memory you know so Dave and I said no you know we're going to design a machine with a memory bus because someday there's going to be semiconductor memory you know if you really are confident and you read you know, I, I've heard that they have 64-bit RAMs now. <laughs> you know, it's only going to get better. This was before Gordon Moore came up with that, but you could see it in those days, right? Things are just getting better. So Dave and I sat down, designed, you know, a data path with the 74172s, all feeding. They had 74181s, which are ALUs. And then you had to use a 182, which is carry look ahead. And you know, we had this basic data path that looked like it would fit on one board. And so, and we did the math. We said, this, we can do this in 600 nanoseconds, you know. Gosh, 1.6 megahertz, the fastest machine known to man. And it's on one board. And, you know, what more do you want? So the biggest problem was control. And so Dave and I had a bake-off because he was enamored with traditional microprogramming. And I said, I love microprogramming. I think it's a wonderful concept, but we got to get this on one board. And we can't spend a lot of time on control store and things like that. And in those days, they started to have, get this, 32 by 8 
ROMs on a chip, right? So one, one chip, you could get 32 bytes of ROM. <laughs> but in reality, what is a ROM, a 32 by 8 ROM, other than an arbitrary eight functions of five variables? So you look at all the control structure. And I said, I'm, oh, I'm a Neanderthal or troglodyte, or whatever you want to call it. But here's all this control structure. Yes, we could build this overhead of a microprocessor with a PC and control store and execution. Or we can just brute force, here's all the control logic. How many functions of five variables is that? And so we came up with something I call hybrid microprogramming because they wanted to use the word microprogram. It really didn't have anything to do with my, but it satisfied the people that wanted to be microprogrammed. And so if you look at the Nova 2, there's a crap load of those huge 32-byte ROMs on there. So most of the logic, and they were pretty fast. I forget now. I mean, it could have been a whopping like 16 nanoseconds or something. Yeah, that fast, you know, through one of those. So you can get an arbitrary, you know, eight functions of five variables is really what you get in a ROM. It's, it's like... What FIUs, FPGAs, any people know FPGAs nowadays? Yeah, FPGA, that's what I do. That's my thing now. I love FPGAs, love VHDL. Um, and those, you know, use what's called a LUT, which means lookup table, right? Well, because it's RAM, because it's programmable. But that's the whole notion is now the ones I'm using now, I'm using Xilinx UltraScale Plus which has eight input LUTs. So it doesn't matter. See, in the old days, you wanted to get away from exclusive ORs or you know, functions with a lot of min terms because it's more propagation delay, right? And so you try to optimize your logic to have you know, the minimum number of min terms. But when you have ROMs or lookup tables, it, it can be the most complicated function you want. It's just a lookup table. Right? I mean, and that's, so that's what the Nova 2 was. Now, one of the things, the first time I ever met the founder of Data General, he comes bursting in the lab and he goes, what's this? You guys got a unibus? And I said, no, because Ed DeCastro formed Data General because he designed the PDP-8. And he had a bake-off with Gordon Bell for the 16-bit machine. PDP-8 is a 12-bit machine. And so he came up with a 16-bit PDP-8 and presented it. And Gordon Bell came up with a PDP-11. And PDP-11 was a lot more complicated. Next time you're at the Computer History Museum, they have them side by side. They've got an original Nova and original PDP-11. One is like this big and one is that big. One's X dollars, the other is X over two dollars. You know which one. And that's what Ed was about. He was a hardware guy's hardware guy. You know, and he designed the Nova. Basically, the Nova architecture is, there weren't as many lawyers in those days, right? <laughs> so, uh, Deck never sued him. He went off and formed Data General and let, you know, Gordon Bell do the PDP-11, right? So, um, but that was basically it. He comes in. So, we did get rid of this, like, gross, there was no, nothing you would call a memory bus. It was like sense wires and inhibit wires and stuff coming out of the processor and going to the memory core memories. There was no clean architecture. So we came up with a memory bus. And so he thought we were copying the Unibus. And he hated the <laughs> Unibus. So he said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I said, well, Ed. And I appealed to him as a optimizing hardware guy. I go, look at how many gates we saved. Look at the drivers. This is great. And he said, okay, okay. And that was it. So, but the Nova 2 was my first introduction to the fact that digital isn't. <laughs> what I mean by digital isn't is that <laughs> everything is analog. Okay? <laughs> and if you've got a 50-foot I.O. bus and you're driving, you know, 64 MA, and all of a sudden, all the ones, actually we used inverted logic because 
there are more zeros than ones, so you know a high was just a pull up, a low was consuming power. So when you went from all ones or all highs, which was all zeros, to all ones, and you looked on a oscilloscope on a so if you open up that nova, don't do it around me. I, you know, get a barf bag out. The the number of red wires that we had to put in to to put in new bus drivers. So and and we put spares on the top of the board. So if you look at the Nova Two board, you know, it's got the spare board chips at the top, the furthest away from the back plane, have these special quad drivers that could actually drive 64 MA and not have ground bounce that would, you know, kill your mother. Um, then it's got twisted pair on that. It's the ugliest board. I mean, I'm embarrassed. The only, my only, you know, fallback is I designed it when I was 19 and I had no idea that digital isn't. Okay. So, so, so how, how does a machine get from being a junior product uh, project to being a data general product, uh, product? No, we were hired at data general. So they were confident you would deliver a product? We, we would go to South Pro and work. And so we, went to, we were employees at data general. I'm, a, again. Yeah, they, but I mean, it's, it's, didn't they have a backup plan? I mean. They had no backup plan. I mean, their thing was, okay, Larry Seligman designed the 1200. And, you know, Ron Gruner was the guru that designed the 800. He's off designing the Eclipse. Oh, okay. And that's going to be a two-board design. And it's going to run in 300 nanoseconds. All that it's going to use. They had this new stuff called shot key. You know, it's just fast. And, you know, Ron knew it. And he did know what he was doing. And it was an expanded instruction set, too. It had things like multiply, divide built in. I mean, but so Larry was kind of in conflict or rivalry with, with Ron. And so Ron was off doing the Eclipse and, and after the 800, and Larry had just done the 1200, and he wanted to know what's next. He's, and he's the one. So when Professor Tung was showing Larry around, because Larry got a Nova, because like I told you, we couldn't, we were juniors. We couldn't use the, eight, the 70K drum. We had to use, we had to use the Nova that was there. And Larry Seligman was, was Professor Tung's student who went off to work there. So he was given a tour and wanted to know, okay, I donated a Nova, is it being used? And he brings them by and Dave and I are in the lab. We were, chances are we were there in the lab any time of day with that Nova. And you know, we were telling him how we love the Nova and all this. And so Larry comes and says, oh, you want a job? And I said, well, now that's when I had to think, eight picoseconds, <laughs> do I want to stay in Cambridge with my girlfriend or go do toilet paper in Vermont? But anyways, um, so we get there, and we were just hired as summer interns. Yeah, but whatever. that's what I mean. You do, normally don't hire a summer intern to make a product. No, but <laughs> this is, that's what I'm telling you about little company. Okay. So, how Here's people, Larry, Larry Seligman is responsible for the next processor because he did the 1200. But, but how big was the company at that time? Oh, I, I was I was number uh, I was number like 891. So oh. it was reasonably big. I don't know. I mean, Dave was 890. He always got that. It was alphabetical. <laughs> That's why he was seven, 16 and I was 17. At rational. But uh, he was 890. I was 891. I remember that well. And. So it was a relatively big company. It already had the Nova, mm -hmm. the Supernova, the, the Supernova Ed did. So Ed did the Nova and the Supernova. And then the, um, um, so Larry wanted to know what to do. So he said, well, you know, at first we were hired to do, we, we had this idea we could do multiprocessing and do a coprocessor that would do comp. Yeah. That was originally what we proposed as a project. But when he said, well, this is a coprocessor, we can use this, Larry goes, well, why don't we just make it a processor? And so it just evolved into being the Nova 2. And, you know, I mean, it's a small company. And, yeah. you know, that's why I've never in my life worked for a big company. And, well, at this point, never will. I mean, <laughs> right. When, when was that 
the number two, when did you start? 72. 72, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it was, you know, we graduated, I have to look here, okay, I graduated in 73, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I remember that, but yeah. So, and remember, I mean, there was 256-bit memory chips came out yeah. around 75 or something, I mean, you know. But, but the Nova 2, at that point, they had those fancy machines that would weave. We had 16K on one, you know, and that's words. So it's 256K bits on one memory board, right? That's why I want to see that sort of machine. Yeah, I mean, again, that's fine mechanics. That's her job. <laughs> right? But um, no, but I've never been able to find any documentation on on the net, uh, on the web about them. Nobody has taken a picture of one apparently. I don't know. I wrote I read something about Forrester, Jay Forrester, yeah. who invented core memory. Yeah. And it got into more of the manufacturing. I don't know how far, but there's ways. The internet's an amazing thing. I mean, if I were interested, I'd look into it. <laughs> it's your job. You're interested, but you need to get your rational emulator working. Any other questions? I may go back to the rational. How successful commercially was the rational machines? So, I mean, it was successful enough that the company got sold to IBM for $5 billion or something like that. Okay. But um, again, as engineers, I mean, I think I only got a measly a million out of it all. I mean, but, you know, so it wasn't like a huge, you know, a, a huge success. But um, we sold a lot because, and a lot was because of Europe. We ended up selling a lot to Scandinavia. We had a branch in Uppsala, Sweden, and you know we had Pierre, Leroy, I mean people in, in Europe. We sold a lot to Europe because of the aerospace industry. We sold to the FCC, the FDA, or not the FDA though, the FAA. They really the new air traffic. The whole Canadian air traffic system was all that. I know one of my first field trips was a machine field at IBM Gaithersburg. And I had to go there and they, of course it was in a secure site so we didn't have remote diagnostics. So I had one of everything. And I go in there and it's my first experience with like you follow this Marine with the M16 and don't look to the left, don't look to the right, just follow him. And I go there, I find out it's an FIU. So I replace the FIU. I say, okay, I'll take this board back and we'll fix it. And they, oh, no, no, you can't take it out. This is a secure site. I say, well, why not? He says, you've got non-volatile memory. I'm going, we have a 64 byte non-volatile memory to hold the serial number, the data manufacturer, yeah, yeah. and the ECO history of this board. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that we cannot encode your whole GPS project. And then the guy goes, ah, oh, how do you know we're working on GPS? <laughs> Everybody knows you're working on GPS. <laughs> it's like they were working on something called Advanced Tactical Fighter. Yeah. And another one. That turned out to be the F-117 Stealth. But we all knew it's even back to when I was at MIT grad school, Marvin Minsky went to Georgia, the Georgia, Russia, to a SETI conference. And he comes back and was telling us all about our Milstar satellites. You know, you could see the type of brand that the guard at the Kremlin is smoking, you know. And so we're all there. The next week, all these guys in black show up at the MIT lab. And start saying, how do you find out about this? How do you find out about this? <laughs> Marvin told us, don't worry. Tell them we found out from the Russians. Who do you want to keep it from, right? <laughs> he went to a conference. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's a military secret, but we found it out from the Russians, so big deal. Sue us. <laughs> you know, here's my handcuffs and all, right? But it's amazing the, 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 how they try to keep secrets of it are irrelevant, really. Everybody knows. Anyone? Question, what's what, uh, how did you price these systems? How did I want? Price. price. Okay, the first one was a million dollars. Yeah. 
And that's Arthur Rock priced it. He said, Millstar. It was actually, that was Millstar, you know, the satellite system too that Lockheed was doing. And um, they had infinite government money, so. charge a million dollars. And so eventually, you know, they wanted to get more penetration, so it went down. I don't know how much that was. I think that was probably only a quarter million or less. I don't know how much we charged for that. I mean, again, remember, there's these guys called sales that are necessary evil. They worry about prices. That's right, that's right. Yeah. I worried about how much it costs to build, but that, you know, in those days, I learned real early about margins, and they tried to have at least four to one margin. So if it costs us, you know, 50000 to build, then they'll charge 100, 200000 to sell, and I, then they I, make good gross margins. I think one of the binders we have your signature on a $50 ECO. How much? Oh, Fif my signature's on an ECO. On e a $50 ECO. A $50 ECO? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but do you know how much it costs? I don't know. No, no. That's, the, that's the, the salespeople. I don't deal with that. You know, I don't know how much. Although I do remember the first one they got it was a million dollars. But, right? And I know that by definition the other ones are lower. But I don't know how much, but we were reasonably successful. I mean, you know, but it wasn't, you know, because of the hardware. It was really because of the software, right? I mean, that's what Rational really was. It was Grady Booch and the Rational environment and all of that that, that made us successful. And what and did IBM get out of it? What's that? What did IBM get out of this? Uh, IBM still owns it. They they sold yeah. Rational Rose and yeah. you know so products. Rational Eclipse. You could go on IBM site and get Rational Eclipse. I think okay. I, there's another product called Eclipse. I think it is okay. based on Rational Eclipse. So yeah. programming environment yeah. for I know C plus plus and C and yeah. stuff. Yeah. But um, I don't think they got a heck of a lot. But sorry, Grady, if he's going to see the tape. What they got was Grady Booch, yeah. all right, okay? So IBM got a lot of, out of, out of Rational, right? So at, at one point, Rational quits hardware. Is that before or after IBM? Before. That's before. That's before. In fact, because I left, okay. So we were designing a chip-based R1000. In fact, Dave Bernstein and I went to France to visit this IC fab house. They had this ASIC development tools, and we were pretty serious into design, designing a chip-based one. But finally, I remember Mike Devlin sitting down with me and saying, you know, we're just going to have to cancel this. It doesn't make sense. Because at that point, you've got the IBM RS6000, the DEC, I forgot what their number was. They started to have risk machines. That, so in the early days, they, they did some graphs, and they were talking about multiprocessing, and they would show where it broke down, you know, like, so an MV, you know, you have this axis is number of tasks, this axis is execution speed. And so MV10-8000 was like that, you know, VAX was like that, rational machine was just flat. It, it multiprocessed like a multitask like it's going on, and that was very important, but after a while, no matter how much you're flat like that, if you're five megahertz, you know, at, at that point, you know, in the early days, five megahertz was fast. <laughs> in those days, you were getting, you know, approaching 100 megahertz. It really wasn't, I mean, I'm talking again, mid 90s, right? I left Rational in 95. So I was there for 13 years and, you know, most people, when I tried to, I, I took a, a year or two off, and but the people, though, would look at it and they say, "Well, nobody in Silicon Valley stays at the same company 13 years. You must not be any good." I go, "Okay, this, that's what you think," <laughs> but you know, eventually, luckily, Intuitive Surgical decided I was I was good, and I switched from computer design to medical design and you know I've been doing that ever since I'm doing ultrasound right now and 
Holzer sounds better because we couldn't grow a third arm on the surgeon and we couldn't speed up the speed of light. So chips caught up with a human being because the rational, I mean the intuitive surgical robot is a Waldo. A Waldo is a class of robots that just follows the human. And that's all it does. It's not a, you do not want to use the word autonomous surgical robot in front of the FDA. The FDA, all the patients. If, if the FDA put the same constraints on a surgical resident that they put on our robot, you'd have no surgeons. You know, you, I've been to a lot of ORs. You stand there like this with your gloves and you touch nothing. If you're doing surgery, I don't go, hey, how you doing? But they wanted it so that somebody accidentally bumped into the surgical robot while it's doing surgery. It has to not move. Now that made it seven times more p powerful because we would have to detect, we had encoders that could detect motion, and we detect, oh, it's moving, and that's unintended motion. We have to oppose it with motors so it didn't move, right? So if, you're, if it's there holding a scalpel inside your abdominal ca cavity and somebody bumps it, it won't slice your, you know, your whatever artery. I'm not that good at anatomy, but yet, it shouldn't have to be like that. I mean, people in the OR know that, you know, you don't <laughs> do that type of thing. But anyhow, but, you know, we, that's why I went into ultrasound because that's when Moore's Law caught up with digital signal processing. See, the old uh, AccuSon machines, GEI 9s, things like that, it's all analog. Remember, digital isn't, <laughs> but digital is now because the FPGAs just deal with all that stuff, right? So now with an FPGA, you can get 1,300 DSPs in one little chip. You can do all this, you know, digitize early, digitize often, right? So you go digital as soon as you can because TI is making like 60 mega sample a second, you know, A to D converters. I mean, so you just do it all in FPGAs, and that's what I'm doing now. But and 13 years at the same company didn't hurt me that badly. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a black mark on your soul in half. I mean, in Silicon Valley, though. Yeah. You know, if, yeah. so. Do you have any idea where we should look for more machines to see if more machines have survived? Do you think somebody like you know Signal in, in Netherlands might have one in the basement? Well, uh, you might want to. We might want to, um, you know, reach out to Greg Beck in Australia. Yeah. And different I mean, places he, like he that has, has tend one. to be less American and throw things away, yeah. you know. So we had a lot in Australia, and he has one the in his basement, and he says that's the only one left in that part of the country. Right. But then Mikhail Vester, he I invited him here, yeah, because he lives in Uppsala, but he's in Spain oh, okay. right now. Well, you have another guy in Spain. Yeah. It must be popular. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, shake the bushes. I'm not that. You know, one of the things is our contacts at the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley. Yeah. You know, and I mean to go there and offer myself as a docent when I finally retire, but I'm only 70. I mean, gosh, I mean, <laughs> it's not time to retire. What? We wouldn't want a model 100. <laughs> You do not. No I doubt you can find a Model 100. <laughs> I, I've got a, I've got a IO bay, but it's, yeah. it's my tool set. But um, there, there must be a few out there. But um, and Grady might be one, but you know, he's more interested in software than yeah. hardware. But um, why Australia? Why was that a good market? Due to the, the Australian military, military really robots. Adelaide. We had like 10 machines in Adelaide, and there's a guy named Greg Beck that I work with really close with. We could try to track him down. Oh, he, he, I have his, his, his you have Greg yeah, Beck? Yeah. yeah. So he, he has a machine in his basement, but he says... He has a machine in his basement? But he says it's lacking pieces that were sent to Terma, so then we have those. Oh. I think, among other things, he doesn't have an IOC. Hmm. Um, so, but he's a contact, and yeah. you know, there are other people. Pascal, you already know. Or not? No, I don't think. Pascal Leroy? I may have his email address. And then there's P. 
Pierre. Yeah, yeah, Pierre. But we got his machine. <laughs> you got his machine. Okay. Now, but Mikhail, I think, would know. But so we had a bunch of machines in Uppsala. Yeah. And there's a company called Terma, I think. Or no, that was a company. That's in Denmark. Um, forgot the name of the company there, though. Well, Ericsson's. Yeah. Ericsson had Yeah. But you know, uh, this has inspired me to to be a little more interested in it. I, ever since you started, <laughs> you tracked me down. <laughs> and I, I've been interested in what he's doing. I, I apologize I haven't had as much time. No, don't worry. Uh, but I've been actually doing real work as I talk about it. So do I. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, OK, any other questions? Well, thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thank you.